working for Time is now its 11th year. And um, my partnership, or the festival partnership with Andy and Kosovo, I believe started a couple of years ago. Because what we were really thinking was, um, well, we're having all of these great artists um, and this great work that was happening. It was also important to like open up the conversation about how the work is made, uh, what the artists are thinking of when they make it, you know, all of the things that sort of putting the work that we're seeing in context. And um, this is what uh, these uh, scanning the landscape uh, conversations have been about. And um, I'm thrilled that Andy has come back to San Diego to share with us. Um, uh, Andy is the uh, founder of Cultural Arts and Media. You can find more information on the, the website, um, the performance blog, um, culturebot.org, and the community program. Um, and thank you so much, all of you, lovely performance actors, artists, you, for being here. And um, another thing is that uh, we're streaming this live on HowlRound, so we'll go Round. Um, so if you don't want to uh, have your words recorded, um, it is. Kill your stuff. It is. <laughs> First, thanks to Mayen, and also it's Mark here. I don't know if Mark's here, but Mark. Okay, so uh, yeah, just, you know, CultureBot would not be possible if Mark, when I, I worked at PS1 by 2 with Mark back in 2002, 3, 4, and uh, so I, I always like, it wouldn't be possible without Mark, so I am um, always grateful to be here and glad and to be here. Um, and this is kind of a, uh, um, so thanks all of you for being here. Um, this is scary. If a bomb drops on this room, we, New York theater is over. Sure. The whole cultural capital shifts to like come down San, San Francisco or something. <laughs> you might get some attention. <laughs> um, I, this is awesome. I'm not. I'm done. <laughs> oh no! I'm sorry. You guys go. No, no. I mean, I. I, mean, I, I saw you thinking. Me? Yeah. No, well, I mean, I'm just really glad you're here. My, it's very, I'm very selfish, because I get to get a bunch of people together that I have great admiration for and just talk to them in front of you. So what I'd like to do is, um, you have everybody's bios. I don't want to take too long, but uh, in just introducing. So if we can just sort of go down and say, hi, I am, and this is what I do. Uh, uh, we'll go there, and then I have a sort of prompt of questions, and we'll just start. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll start at the end. There's a new face, but hopefully uh, someone who becomes more familiar with mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Leonardo. I'm presenting here in the trailer for that season. Hi, I'm Paul Zivit. I'm an uh, artistic director of Talking Band, and um, we're celebrating. You also had a method training, didn't you, before that? Um, well, I, yes. <laughs> uh, not really, oh. but I, I don't, I, I did go to NYU New York Kids uh, Studio program. So I did take uh, two years of classes at the Stella Adler Conservatory of Dance. <laughs> but we could talk about that, because she was kind of anti-method. 
I'm Tony Torn. I'm an actor and a director. I've also done a lot of experimental work over the years. Some of it in companies uh, that I've worked with Richard Mahanawak and Les Abdo and Richard Foreman. I also basically work with whoever will have me. And uh, in terms of experimental versus traditional acting, both my parents, Richard and Shirley Page, were very involved in the actor studio. But my mother used to say in acting class, the method is whatever method works for you. <laughs> about method because it seemed like a, 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 an entry point to a discussion, but it certainly doesn't have to be the focus of the discussion. I, I think more of, for personally, um, as I've been watching work over the past few years, I've started thinking more and more about how kind of uh, amazing acting is <laughs> as a thing, and, and that um, I learned this word, I can't believe I'm really old, I learned this word phenomenology, which is our experience of being in the world, and I started thinking how amazing it is that talented people can stand up in front of other people and with nothing create these sort of conditions where we're experiencing the world through you and with you in these sort of crazy ways. Not crazy, but crazy, but like deep, profound ways. And so I just wanted to sort of talk to a bunch of people who are really good at it about sort of um, their experiences, um, whether it's coming from like sort of method training and then sort of how what your experience is of, of, of working live on stage, um, how like working with uh, the Worcester Group or with Reza Abdo or with Richard Foreman or uh, different directors um, influences the way you think about what you do. <coughs> um, and we actually have, and um, both, um, and, and, and now that I realize it, I didn't realize this before, Leonardo was a director who was formerly an actor who had been an actor. He, um, has a, an ensemble that they've got their work now, Ojardim, playing over at La Mama. Paul is a director as well. If you direct it, you're, you've got, I'm not sure what the, the situation is with who who's in who. Who's well, I co-directed with uh, Dan Safer, right? I've also directed Shakespeare and John Gunnison Sing, and, and I've actually directed uh, pieces of Juliana's as well. So yeah, I'm wholly in both camps. So I think I, I, it was more just about sort of, um, uh, uh, all these, these, these questions were really clear in my mind. That's it. <laughs> Norm, do you have a good question? <laughs> <laughs> this morning was all clear in my mind. And, and then it just sort of. Well, um, one thing, I mean, I, I know that a number of people on the panel have, um, have looked at areas outside of theater as a source of training that they then brought into their theater practice, and that's something that always interests me, mm -hmm. because often it's quite submerged, and it's, it's not anything that, unless you talk to the person at length, you would know, and I, I'm always curious about that, how non-theatrical training and practice intersects with the world of theater, whether it's yogic training or Eastern disciplines, you know, some of which have kind of martial roots um, and have filtered down into theater and other cultures, but not ours. Well, I, um, I, 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 I have a background in music. Um, I, I went to high school in music and art before I was performing art. Uh, and uh, music has always been a really important influence in our work of the talking band. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I think anybody, any discipline, somebody has can be the discipline that, you know, feeds them. It's not like just one discipline. But for me, that's uh, something that has a lot of connections with acting. There are actually a lot of artists who do martial arts and particularly have you know, uh, <coughs> awareness, respond in the moment, be sensitive to the present, all that kind of stuff. Sensitive. 
So, uh, I, I, so speaking of awareness and being present, what's the, um, like you guys at the Worcester Group build together, you don't have to start necessarily as a playwright. Um, actually, every piece Sorry, you, yeah. uh, since I've been with the company had a play somewhere. Uh -huh. It might have been commingled or bricolaged with other materials, but there was always a play. I was thinking that um, at the Worcester Group, um, when I started working with the company, Liz had already, the, the director of the Worcester for Comics, had already made three pieces, uh, three places in uh, New England. Rhode Island. Rhode Island, thank you. <laughs> That's right. Um, thank you. <laughs> but it was with Spaulding's autobiography, and the first piece, Taconic Point, was um, very much uh, more like performance art. It wasn't really a text, it was a lot of sound. And um, Liz doesn't come from a theater background. She's not trained in the theater. She's a studio artist, a visual artist, who got involved with theater because she had a relationship with Spalding and Gray. And they came, she was actually a stage manager for Richard Schechner. But her work started very formally, very visually, with Spalding's need and impulse to perform. So she was interested in uh, real life, in behavior, in what you just said about responding. Uh, and so they had already started working. I even asked her this, because I said, don't you want to do this panel? Because you kind of made it, you know, all, all this stuff, other than been I've been working with her a, a long time, but it was that impulse to use uh, Spalding's uh, autobiography and the actual tapes that he made with his father and the doctor around his mother's suicide, where that seminal piece from To Blow came from. And I said, and she said, um, because I said, oh, do you work with tapes and recordings and TVs? Because then, you know, you can get rid of the actor trying to control and shape everything because uh, she can't stand that, <laughs> you know? Um, and she wants to see somebody really present so that the impulse and the action are as close together as possible. And by actually literally using the tapes, a whole aesthetic started to develop around that. So it's a lot of working with pre-recorded material, mixing it with not pre-recorded, live, uh, recorded, amplified, not amplified. So there's lots of juxtapositions and it's been a long road of the aesthetic uh, involvement of that. But, the imp and, but, but because she was kind of liberated from any sort of uh, knowledge of how somebody should direct or how, what, Actors do, or there's. It was. It was. It, she came at it like visually, orally, and and it was. She always takes the impulse of, from the performers of what they want to do in terms of who somebody brings a text in. So there's always been a play since I've been in the company. First piece I did with you on the nine, and it was our town, even though it's mixed with other things. But Kate, can I ask? It seems that many of the shows have at their core of the research process some kind of physical discipline, either a martial art, you know, the stick training, or a sport, the badminton, or another theater form, the kabuki oh, training. Yeah. And because so there seems to be a kind well, of physical very, training that. Very, I wouldn't even call it training. We're all dilettantes, you know. We're not, I mean, how you can. But you do it together. Watch some videotapes of kabuki theater and everything. Americans, we have relationships, we have a relationship, I mean, with the television. Of course, now, screens are multifarious, but, you know, in, in my development with the company, it's always through the box, it's the TV, and, and that is acknowledged in the pieces and incorporated aesthetically. But yes, there's always some uh, way of uh, animating the room so that there can be a kinetic light against which the text can vibrate. So there's always like, oh, you know what we ought to do? Um, bad news. Now, I've started with ping pong, actually. Mm -hmm. And just to like, half the time, almost like, okay, we read the play. 
it was Paul Schmidt's adaptation of Phaedra, uh, in which he dispensed with the rhyming couplets. And the language was very much like soap opera, but the proportion of the story was so huge, it was hard to reconcile you know, the sort of soap opera language in this and, and, a, and a Greek, a story of Greek proportions where a woman seducing her stepson doesn't really seem like such a big deal. But so it was the uh, table tennis and then uh, the badminton and then the notion of the court, you know, the court and the court of Louis the Fourteenth mm -hmm. when he wrote it and it just started to evolve from there. But there's always something we do just to uh, animate the room, something to connect. It's so, something, there are a bunch of stuff that you said sort of set the world's fire, but I, I, the question that is, is what actors do, like it, like that, when you said she was interested in what actors do, and I, and, and I think it's interesting, it's like, it's not what, where this method question comes from, it's not what actors feel, it's what they do, and sort of the doing and presence in the moment, and. I was just thinking about the, particularly the, the women I'm surrounded by right here, like the sort of like proportion and size like of presence. Mm -hmm. And like how, like what's the experience of like Birgit, when you were in um, Telephone, there was like that 10 minute monologue, right? 40 minute monologue? <laughs> <laughs> That kind of was almost, if I had encountered that text on the page, I would have been mystified. I wouldn't have known what to do. And, and, and as an actor or as a reader, um, it was a, is Melanie here or Ken? Oh, anyway. anyway, it's, it's a, I, I, who was the playwright? Ariana Rennes. Ariana Rennes. Yeah. And um, it was this incredibly dense, difficult text. And like, all of a sudden, you filled the room for this enormous amount of time, taking us on this sort of really sort of intense journey. And, you know, and I've seen you do it too, like, and you, like, 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 I'm just curious, like, what is the, how, how does that work? Is there any way you could talk about <laughs> yeah. that? Like the, 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 the finding of it, or the, the actual the Maybe the finding of it first. Um, yeah, it's sort of like, um, I guess par partially it, it feels like maybe just trying to be open to whatever it brings up for me. Um, so there was a certain amount, like, there was a certain amount of prior, like, uh, actual knowledge about Babette Stau, the patient that the monologue was based on. And I, so I, did research about that um, because Ariana used some of her actual text and sort of went from there. So that felt useful and important to have the exposure to. And then um, Ariana also used Avital Ronell's The Telephone Book as a source for telephone. And so I did not get to read all of that, but definitely went back to that as a source to sort of feel like where does her mind go? Um, and even though I focused, the monologue was separate from act one and act three, but they also resonated with each other. So anyway, like, so trying to be as informed as I could be, looking, and then um, I really like going, um, uh, visual, visual is one of my entry points where I just love, I'll go to this strand, to the outdoor, one dollar stand and get gallery books and just whatever, like something from the time period or going on the internet and being like, I want to look at asylums from that period and um, which were, I think, fairly new then as well. So I'd get pictures there and then whatever piece of art resonated with me, like contemporary, so something that took me back to the time period as well as now, because that's where I am, that's where, and, um, so for that, I actually made this huge collage for myself. Um, and then um, it became a lot of uh, trial and error, a lot of failure, a lot of talking to, I mean, because then ultimately, after gathering all, I felt like stimulus in 
whatever worked poetry. I like going to poetry a lot. Um, um, it then, obviously, then it comes back to dealing with the actual text <laughs> that I've been given. And so it was a lot of finding out from Ariana what was going on in her for her. And then um, uh, Ken, the director. I am definitely one who needs a director. Um, I love, like, I will try to source whatever comes up for me, but then in the funneling and focusing, uh, that's very useful. But during that process, oh, I'm blabbering, D but during that process, we just went through, like, do, the, do this section like Marilyn Monroe. Do this section like, and we were just, uh, we ha had to just keep, um, uh, a lot of physicalizing of the text. <laughs> I, 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 a lot of play. How do you know? I mean, I think there is. It's, it's hard to articulate, so don't feel yeah, like. I'm, I'm like, how do you know when, like, when the pieces fall into places, or like, is it just like a? Uh, you, you, um, I think you often know because suddenly you just. I don't know. I, I, you just sink in, and I mean, one one cue for me often is if I if I remember the lines, that means I understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, even though sometimes you work for people who ask you to memorize things beforehand, so that kind of blows that. But um, I mean, it's kind of like like listening to you speak. It sort of makes me think. Have you ever seen that like video of a bower bird that you can find on YouTube with <laughs> Sir Richard Attenborough talking about birds? And <laughs> there's this little bird that lives somewhere in a, a rainforest, and it constructs like over a period of years, it constructs this like amazing nest that's like sort of like an arch. And then it decorates it, and it's very, very specific. Like the one you see in, in YouTube, it like collects this pile of dung and arranges it, and then it gets upset. It looks like it's upset anyway when it, like, little sprouts start growing out. So it's like picking them off, and it's all to attract the female bird. This is a male bird that does this incredible structure. So it's like I, I feel like when in approaching most roles, it's like you're you're kind of always making these constructs and these places in which like the spirit can live, in which the meaning of whatever you're reaching for can live. And then on the other hand, you're also you know, tasked to create actions that cohere to the director's vision and to the playwright's vision. And, and, and so that those two activities, one which is kind of prosaic and just is like, okay, right here I am doing this very specific action, which is actually a surprising thing, but I find it helpful mm -hmm. in a lot of contexts. But also simultaneously creating this kind of space in which like things can happen and things can surprise you and things can so surprise feels like a really important word. I feel like years and years ago, I got to sit in the back of a book about the Joe Taken who speaks in, and surprise seemed to be like, how do you surprise yourself? How, how, do, how do we cultivate the possibility of surprise at any given moment happening on stage? So something's actually happening in front of us, is it not? So you know, in some sense, are you, do you think, are you guys sort of talking about building kind of like I don't know, structures to perform mm -hmm. in with there's enough room for like, if the, like, the audience, you know, for something to happen. Sure. I mean, I think that's where you're always trying to do is surprise yourself. Mm -hmm. In some way, not, not to, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's curious because, I mean, theater's about repetition. I mean, if you, if you repeat it over and over again, but some, rep, some repetition is deadening and some repetition is like, gives you a structure that then within that structure you can something new all the time and how to find that right structure is I think the, the key uh, to it. Um, I mean, I, I, my, my, most of my training as a young actor was with Joe Chapin and it was very physical theater and kind of a physical structure. And uh, I remember a very strong kind of moment of revelation for me. We were doing this piece called Terminal and it was about people being possessed by the dead and uh, Susan Yankovitz had written this text based on this uh, 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 voodoo queen, uh, Marie Laveau, who was an actual voodoo queen from New Orleans, and had a very strong rhythm. And um, Joe decided to bring in uh, an actual Brazilian voodoo priestess to do kind of a, well, actually get, get us all drunk. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Were 
but there was this kind of, so anyway, I took this text home and there was this uh, very strong rhythmic component. I started to dance with it. And uh, then I came in the next day and I started to do this thing with this kind of crazy dance. Uh, and just something started coming through me, you know, and I was sort of blown away by it. And I could tell everybody else was blown away by it. And I got really scared because I felt like, uh, you know, was this, was this me <laughs> doing it? Or was it something else? Was it repeatable? <laughs> and, um, and then I realized that, you know, if I, I, what I had found was I could do it again because it was the structure, it was this dance that I had found that, that gave me this rhythm that was in my body that when I hit it, this other voice of this voodoo queen of uh, New Orleans came through me, but it was, it was finding the right uh, physical structure, the right rhythm for it that allowed that. I, I want to, quick comment, uh, good old Dave, Ralph Lemon had a show a couple years ago, he was a choreographer at BAM, called Why Do You Sit Around the House All Day and Never Go Anywhere? And there was a 20 minute, once again, one of these massive, crazy, like sections that looked like it was entirely improv and that was generated, I, 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 unfortunately Oprah couldn't be here, but she could tell us about it. Um, it was like 20 minutes long of like crazy what looked like improv and that and got that like getting them all wasted and making them dance for like five hours in a rehearsal room. So the good old days are still there. You can make them happen. <laughs> yes. Get your actors drunk. I hear your whole show is drunk. Well, they, we just heard that we can't actually sell the absinthe to the slipper room because of their bar alarm, so we're just going to have a bottle on stage. Uh, so homemade we'll absinthe. But you can come see me. Tonight and tomorrow. Yes. Only. You can come see me. I, I will have a flask of absinthe on me well, during the performance. So and I want to I come back to that because of, and, and because you and your, your cohorts were you whole and, 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 but this show and Julie, like, it's yeah. about excess in a lot of ways. Yeah, for sure. And sort of what does that do physically and sort of like, why is that a place that you find compelling to go? Well, I mean, with my, the history I've had with performance, I mean, I was you know, raised with parents who were like them for a traditional theater. My dad did a production of Richard III as Richard Nixon. Um, <laughs> Jefferson Airplane back in my So I was exposed <laughs> to stuff like that, even in that tradition. And um, working with Reza Abdo, uh, we, you know, we were going through that sort of stuff a lot. So in many ways, doing the Ubu was sort of like trying to create a space for myself where I could reaccess that stuff, because I knew I felt comfortable there. And it wasn't really that uh, common for me to be invited back into that kind of a space. So I said, fuck it. I'm going to try to create a circle for myself to step into and find people who want to step in with me there. But it's all the same work. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it really goes down to identifying with character in the end. And that's just a basic acting thing. I think, you know, people need to be attracted to the work where they can really identify with what they're doing. Um, and I love naturalistic work. I mean, one, of my, one of my favorite naturalistic um, experiences right here at the public at the for him and Juan was uh, Yellow Face, and that was a beautiful experience mm -hmm. to do a very realistic character in some ways. Um, but um, I think a lot of us here are just like a little weirder. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm, I, that attracts me, but then I'm just so also attracted to things that are just not as commonly available. Mm -hmm. So um, I really like that. So, and when I'm in that space, it, I, you know, it, I use all the same identifications to make everything super specific, but it just doesn't seem weird to me to make it specific that, um, you know, I'm farting on stage for <laughs> for 90 seconds without, with the, at, in the middle of being coordinated and just being a toilet. <laughs> for that, for me, I identify with that very much. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, it, it, it's just about, um, using the same tools, but just being the sort of person who chooses to identify with a wider range mm -hmm. of what's possible to identify. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I want to um, say one thing about the structure. I'm sorry. But yeah, no, no. Um, there's there's, there's uh, one thing that Yoshi Oida, uh, who was an actor with Peter Brook, said in one of his books that he had studied with uh, some uh, kabuki master. That he said, uh, you, you know, you learn from
student, you know, how to point to the moon, but from the tip of his finger to the moon is his responsibility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, so you get the gesture, but how you fill that gesture, and with one person you might see somebody making this elegant gesture of flipping the moon, and you're only thinking about is that actor making an elegant gesture, and with another person you're looking at the moon. that as a transition to Leonardo, uh, because we, uh, we learned yesterday that O Jardim was, was made with the actors actually in their real life stories, and it, and it, is, and it deals with issues of memory and stuff like that. And I was thinking about what, when Paul just said, well, two things. One was when you were talking about that early process with Liz, and bringing stuff out of Spaulding's life and the questions of, of working with the recorded material and then turning it into and then, not you personally, her. And then um, what Paul said about, are you looking at the actor making the gesture, are you looking at the moon? And um, what, how did you, how do you work with your ensemble and what do you have to get what you're looking for out of them? And then how do you sort of transition it from mere autobiography or mere biography into this other thing so that we can see not just the artifacts but this other thing? How do you think about communicating with your actors in that process? Yeah, uh, I'm so excited. I have been nervous to talk about this because actors are still, and even I've been an actor before, if they are a mystery to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's what's beautiful. They are, I can understand them, them fully, and that's, that's wonderful. I think in, in our work, what, uh, each actor has a very different background. We have stood together, but each actor has a different background. So I left the I will do this not theatrical work as they wish. I have one of the actors, for instance, that worked with this voodoo thing almost. That's very Brazilian thing. That's the exhausting. The Tiago is dancing all the time. And we have another actress that's, that, that's working with Kung Fu and another actress that, that's working with another technique. And we have these different layers. But together, on, on we are when we are it's rehearsing together, we work with just basically with breathing. We we have we have an exercise that we do that we have seven layers of seven levels of breathing that we we it's a it's, it's a very internal thing. I can explain it later. But <laughs> we 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 work with this breathing that just to make this connection. And uh, we have two two moments in the rehearsal. One moment that's not just about acting, but it's about creating because it's their memories, they are working with their material, so it's very important that they, they put that everything they have in their memories and work on this and how to fictionalize it. And it's not about composing something because they are called by their own names, they are not acting. Of course they are acting <coughs> on, on stage, but the idea is just how <coughs> to deal with time and with uh, present, I think, because O Jardim is a very mathematical play. You have a very mathematical connection. You, it's very s mind, it's very cerebral, cerebral. It's very cerebral because you have this time here and I have this cue here and I have this box here. So when she says that, I have to say this and to take the box B12, for instance. Mm -hmm. They are always connected in action. They have to, to know exactly mathematically what's going on. And also, they have, we allow some islands of silence. Then my request to the actors is that they don't have to act during these moments. They have just to wait and just to deal with this presence. So in the uh, last talk we had, after talk we had in the show, one of the actors said that, and I, it was funny to hear that, that's, that's funny because she creates something about her memories. And then she thinks that she's creating another thing than another character. And in some point during doing it, she, per she, she realizes that she's doing herself. And uh, it, for me, it's very interesting to realize what is the actor trying to, to, to express an idea and what the actor really present there, here, because it's very tricky to use this autobiographical thing. In some point, it seems very narcissistic. 
to do it. But it also can be seen as a sacrifice. I tell this to the actors, it sounds a little kitschy, but we, we use this, the sacrifice that I'm here and we are sharing this moment and dealing with this time and only this present, I think it's enough because we, that's, that's our question there. I don't know if I'm answering your question. I'm, I'm talking about our process. Yeah, right? no, I, I mean, there, there's no one, I mean, I'm not, I, I have no desire to answer. You know, I'm, <laughs> may I, I, may I ask you a question? Like, yeah. The breathing <laughs> practice, where did that come from? The, the, sorry? The breathing practice, the breathing. where did that come from? We, uh, Who brought uh, it, how was it learned? Yeah, we, we have this notion, we are, we are always thinking about fiction and reality. So I was thinking about how we can find patterns of fiction and reality. So I, I was looking to here now and seeing that, that in fact nobody's acting, but everybody's acting. And what makes the difference between one body and another body is the, the body tension you have, and that comes from the, the speed or the, the tension or the I don't know the, the English word for this. The tonus. Tonus. Do you know what it is? Tone. No, not tone. No it's Portuguese the speakers quality, in the audience. The quality of the, of the muscle of the. <laughs> the tension. No, the tonus. I don't know. Uh, and that comes from your breathing, somehow. So the, my breathing determines somehow the speed I speak, how I speak. I can be, and we created. It's a very arbitrary. It, it's, it's experimenting. We've, well, we have this breathing that we can call it a death breathing, for, for instance. We call it death breathing. Mm -hmm. That's when someone exiles the mold and, and holds, and then inhales the mold and holds the, the longer. Then we have this desert. Then we, we don't have the hold, but we have. So you develop this yourselves. Yes. And then we have this bitch, we call it bitch, that's soap opera, you know, this <laughs> soap opera. And now oh, I'm very cool, and uh, I'm here. And we have this suspense, that's B-movie, we call it B-movie. <laughs> that we have the, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's very, we work with this, we, you can see this on stage, but that's uh, an island to the actor. So they, he doesn't have to, they don't have to be psychological all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I'm feeling this. They can be breathing, mm -hmm. and that's an action. and. And not visual action, but a very action, and that allows the silent moment that you can project yourself in this. And oh, you can imagine the actors are doing something, but they are in fact breathing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I think that's the yeah. I, I want so I was thinking. Uh, so I'd like to ask everybody to. I, this is a question for everybody. Um, you know, uh, it doesn't, and I'm not asking anybody to pick a favorite show or pick. But but like um um to share with us like a moment where you're like where like you were like I fucking nailed that or like <laughs> this was the worst night but like like something that like like probably the story that like all of your friends have heard but we haven't heard about like something that was like this is the the this is this is what it's about I know that's a, it's a very like actor studio type question but, <laughs> but but I honestly don't get to you know. We, we don't get to like hang out with you guys on a regular basis and hear about your experiences and you know I'm, I hope that's not too personal to ask. Can I piggyback on that? Because just because having seen a number of these actors over the years, yeah. I have the impression that some people, and Juliana, I remember this from the early years of seeing you on stage. <laughs> that there are some people who really go away somewhere during a performance. And when I would see them after the show, it takes time for them to come back. And then there are other performers that I feel are never go. They're completely on the stage in a, um, in a very kind of choreographic, mechanical sense. So you can talk to them two seconds after the curtain comes down, and they're right where they, right back on stage, right back where they were before the curtain went up. And I, I wonder how that affects the, your experience during the performance itself. 
Like if, if you go where you go, and if you're not gone, if you're one of those people who's really completely at the center of the action along with everyone else, um, how, um, then what constitutes an extraordinary performance other than something going wrong? For, for them, like when they, yes. when they, when you guys finish a, a performance, that you're like, that was a, that was an extraordinary one versus it was just, I, I kind of, something else. Yeah. <coughs> that kind of makes me think, um, well, about two things really, but uh, one is that like, if you really like, like do the kind of work and build the structures that a lot of folks are mm -hmm. talking about is like an actor in that sense is sort of like an electrician. Like I felt like when I've created a successful role, then I've grounded all the wires and I can then receive a very strong jolt mm. of something that I didn't need or something that I believe in, like some like degree of emotion or remembered trauma or something that I feel very strongly needs to I mean, there is a kind of channeling energy to your performance in particular. I guess so. I mean, in, in oh, but that only works really if you do this sort of like nuts and bolts stuff. Yeah and really ground all that stuff, then something like enormous can happen and you can really be shaken during the performance, but then you recover pretty quickly because there are no loose wires that are like, or loose after words that are messing <laughs> up. Like, yeah. So you can be like, hey, how are you? Pretty much. But um, I mean, that also kind of makes me think about what you were asking earlier about um, outside influences. Mm -hmm. Like for me, a big one is I grew up in a very, very religious family, like one generation back theater was basically the devil's pastime. And, um, but it's, it's always been kind of contradictory to me because I'm like, well, you all were preachers. Like, that's kind of theater, even though you, you know, thought that, like even, like at my, my great-grandfather got in a fist fight with my grandfather outside of the rectory once because my grandfather uh, said that the Book of Job was a great drama. <laughs> and that was, so they started actually physically beating each other up. <laughs> but, um, to me, like just that degree of meaning and that the fact that they both cared so much about the Book of Job is a big influence for me as an actor, even though they would probably wish I'm dead and all that. But does that make any sense? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense to me having seen your performances over the years because I think a lot of people, a lot of audience members view you as a kind of priestess, as someone who's channeling you know, a, a sacred energy well, through I mean, your performances, Tony or at least I, yeah. with Dara Luz. But Tony uh, knows this too. I mean, like Reza, who was the artistic director of Dara Luz, like, um, he literally defined himself as a warrior healer. So we were like charged, you know, we were entrusted with that, with that kind of war and that kind of healing, so. Yes, but Tony yeah. got to be the clown, and you got to be Reza's mother. The priest. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, whatever that Madonna figure is. Yeah. Well, you know, just to talk about that, it's interesting because I always uh, consider myself a person of, um, who doesn't so much channel, but um, sort of like reach into myself to find identification from in, within myself um, <clears throat> for the role. So I'm, I'm parading different aspects of myself. Um, there's another thing that Reza also, he did charge us with this holy, um, Goal, but he, and we also talked about the uh, Arto definition of the actor being an athlete of the heart, <laughs> which um, is also sounds very holy and all that stuff. But it's also very practical. It's like if you think of yourself as an athlete and doing tasks and you know, performing physical actions with a certain kind of commitment and grace, but you're doing it with internal stuff as well that also kind of brings it down. But um, to go back to um, you know, I really think that Ubu. Well, first of all, I think that this last year is the first time I really felt like I've arrived as an actor for myself. Mm -hmm. I think I've been very, very lucky with the people I've worked with. And I think I do have a sort of, and I, you know, I remember when I was 10 years old, um, I sort of looked at myself in the mirror and said, yeah, this is, this is okay. This is, this is material that can be used. And so I've always felt like I, <laughs> I have something that uh, other directors can use and that I, I have to I, I, I wish I had known that 10 year old. Yeah. Tony. And so, well, 20. Oh. And I'm drugs. But um, I really feel that I've kind of, I really 
now feel like I've come into my own. And I think it, the, the, there's a difference now in my work, just recently. Because uh, what it is, I went away to Austria and I worked with a good friend of mine, Yossi Wanuni, for about, I did all these different roles with a company called Toxic Dreams. I sort of like took myself out of New York for a while. I just wanted a reboot. And I went out to work and did these incredible things in Vienna. I came back and I just feel different. And I think Ubu, um, even though Ubu really expresses stuff that's deep in me, it's just like a total um, opportunity to express every, all my id, all my sort of like baby um, polymorphous perverseness in a way that's really ecstatic. But I, for the first time, I really feel that I've become somebody else. I really feel that, I mean, I do this for the first time. I have people come up to me and I'm like, you should see my show. It's coming back, you know, to the sliver room. It's like, I saw the show. We drank absinthe together and you dry humped me. <laughs> and I don't remember. Uh, I, uh, I've gone to a place with Ubu where I really, I've become somebody else mm -hmm. for 90 minutes. And that's thrilling to me because that's really not really the usual way I work. So um, um, I, I, I guess I have to point to that. Well, one of the things that, like, I, I mean, you, you sort of proposed a, a, a dichotomy between but like a, a more, let me just make this simple. I think um, <laughs> there's there's all the spiritual channel-y stuff, but I think there's also, you know, just practical stuff. And I think and one of the things that I feel like sometimes when I watch people, it's like they, they you, like you're talking about building the, putting all the, grounding all the wires, you know? And it's like, you can't have like the Herm Hermes imaginative out there energy without the sort of Apollonian structure you know, like, like, you know, and the, so I'm, I don't know, I mean, I, I don't want to, like, categorize people, but, like, I feel like when I watch, like, when I watch Emperor Jones, like, like, and I mean, everyone stage here is a, is a rigorous craft person, I'm not saying, but I felt like, 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 you're not, you're pretty petite, and you were massive, and I felt like you were almost like, you know, like, a, like a big, giant thing. And it felt very structural. I, I'm not saying it did well, but it felt very structural in a way. If that makes sense, like it felt like like you had constructed this. Is that does that? This is my experience of it. Can you? No, it was a giant mass. You know. Yeah. That's what where theater basically comes from. Mm -hmm. It was a long, long time ago. But um, yeah. So the. Double negative, where you you negate the yourself as a performer by putting on the mask, and then you negate the mask by stepping outside and seeing yourself in it, and then you can become that third thing, which is is it you, but something that is a vehicle for um, the text. For yeah, I mean, I saw a really great debate at Town Hall between August Nielsen and um, Brucey. Robert Brucey. Yeah, like we were together. And yeah. they were debating sort of timidly uh, moderated by Jenny Pierce Smith. I thought she kind of, she's a friend of mine, but I thought she, she didn't really push too hard one way or the other. And Wilson was saying that people need to play like that Black people need to make black theater from a black place with black actors and a black writer and that there shouldn't be any, he was totally against colorblind casting. And then Brucey was for it. And uh, somebody yelled out in the audience, what about masks? You know, like somebody just, 
some voice from you know, theater history. <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of not, it didn't really, the debate didn't go anywhere, but the, it was generated a lot of interesting conversation in, uh, in the audience. For anyone who's interested, that that the transcript of that in a kind of uh, you know synthesized form is online at the TCG American Theater. American Theater Magazine sponsored it. TCG. And you'll share it on Facebook after the show. After the I, it's there somewhere in their archive. Yeah. Um, I, this is actually a good chance. Well, so I'm going to want to uh, mask. Blah, blah, blah. I just, Richard couldn't be here today, but I'm going to pass this around. Richard Maxwell just wrote a, a, a book called Theater for Beginners, and this is the program oh we're on. Because um, he talks about it in super, super duper rudimentary, like do this, pick up a chair, do this. Um, and this is this is the program from, um, no, I'm not going to remember the show. The last show. Yeah. Which one? Was it the, the most recent show? No, it's like three shows ago. Uh, neutral, neutral hero, and uh, in there, there's a, so pass those around, and there's a section called uh, theater for beginners, and it's an excerpt. And the book I think is coming out next week. I actually have a copy oh, of the do. book. Uh, theater, he's a friend of mine, and um, I just keep it with me all the time. It's a beautiful little book, and it's it's. Uh, organized in chapters, but a series of aphorisms that are just beautiful and um, very basic and, and can be meditated on in any given situation. I, I use it every day. He has something that he talks about, which I find really interesting, that as a performer, you are somebody before you walk in the door. You are somebody who is a composite of all your experiences, and vices and shames and guilts and passions and everything. And then you come in the door to get in front of a group of people. And of course, there's this text that you're embodying for the audience. And that you, what you walk in the door with is what you bring to it. And that <clears throat> he has this really funny section talking about when he was in acting school and um, you know, they're working on some scene like their first kiss, and he felt like he played the part, he remembered his first kiss, and he really felt it, and then the next day he couldn't do it again. And then he realized that the audience isn't interested in your first kiss, they're interested in their first kiss. And that all you need to do is something recognizable uh, so that they can do their, the audience can do their job. I mean, I, I always, I, I, when I go to see performer, performances, and I, I always sort of, a friend of mine and I, we sort of say relaxing or not relaxing, you know, about, and, and if somebody is breathing and somebody is present, but whatever means necessary, um, then there's room for me in it, you know? If, I, if you see somebody and they're so busy showing you all their ideas about how good they did their job, you know, there's no room for me in it. I feel like I'm shut out. It, the, 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 the world sh becomes smaller and it's like, good, but why do we go to the theater? To see something good? I don't think so. We go for transcendence and transcendence is possible and that's why you theater people repeat things night after night because it is a ritual after all. And you know there is that possibility every time you go to the theater. But um, but that book, uh, Theater for Beginners, is great. But the thing that I do every day, you know, uh, going to the performing garage, is a whole section called What Do You Want? You know, the whole book is for performers. It's not for academics or directors or anything. No, it's an actual it's handbook. It's a handbook for performance. Yeah. And, 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 and the whole section about what do you want as a performer, because he says when he works with performers, and they say, what do you, am I giving you what you want? And he gets mad and he says, well, what do you want? You know, and then I realized that that's like a hugely important for me. You know, what do I want? You know, because a lot of times I think I 
can't stand this another minute. I'm out of here. I don't know why did I make these choices. Why have I been here so long? What am I doing? <laughs> you know, I can't bear this another second. I'm out of here. But then it's like, well, you know, of course that's neurotic. <laughs> and uh, of course I have, you know, some deep compulsion or need to be there. And but when I ask myself such a tangible question, what do I want? And it's different every day. It can change many times in the course of one day. And he, he says you can break it down to a sentence to fill it. You know, like, it's not like, what does my character want? You know, what do I want existentially? No, what do I want right now? What do I want? And, and, and you can change it to, I want to blank. Or, which helps me, I will blank. <coughs> I usually ask myself that right before I open the door. You know, like, I will, and then it just comes to me, you know, not give her a hard time, you know. Or, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is, what, you know, whatever yeah, it needs yeah. to be, it's often a surprise to me. And, but it's very useful, that little book. It's good uh, to be, be a beginner all the time. And that's a, it's a beautiful little book. Can I ask one last question, and then I know you want to open it up, but if, as you work with younger actors and people ask your advice, where should I train, you know, how do I become you, what, however they ask it, where do you point them? Like it sounds like Kate would hand someone this book. Well, no, I would tell somebody much more basic, like, just keep working. Find what interests you and volunteer. Keep working. Yeah, I, I, I taught a lot um, in, in various workshops. We've done very at the university for many years. And I, I find the problem with most young actors is they want a method. You know, they want they want somebody to hold on to. You know, like, tell me what's the formula. And uh, so the first thing I tell them is, like Tony and Carol. You know, uh, that's what, what works for you. But in order to do that, you really have to try a lot of things. You just go in and explore this, anything that interests you, you know, and s steal, take, absorb all those things and, and, and really find what works for you. And you realize that there's not, there's not uh, one training thing. And I think a lot of times people feel they're really great things like points or you know, the Suzuki thing and people say, oh, if I learn Suzuki points, if I learn Suzuki, boy, I'm going to be a great actor and go tramp my feet around the ground. It's not going to do that. It, it's, it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's great training as many other things are training. But the thing, I, I think one of the fundamental things I learned working with Joe Chapin was he was great at inventing exercises and he hated the idea that any of those exercises would ever be written down and learned by anybody else. You know, they should be like paper plates to discard. Because the exercises were to try to reach some particular problem or question you were dealing with in a particular piece. So like you were inventing your breathing exercise because you're trying to get at some specific thing you're you're thinking about. And that's what you have to do. You have to find what it is you want to get at, what's the question you're asking. And then find the tools to do that. And you might have to reach outside to a visual source, to some uh, uh, cargo dancing, to whatever you're going to help you reach that thing. And then use that. But don't just get some package that goes with it. I just want to put in the plug I'm doing. I'm starting a, a script analysis class, non traditional <coughs> analysis class, at my organization, Torn Page. We teach out of my house in Chelsea. If anybody's interested in that, it starts in February. I'll send them to me. Oh, yeah. Okay, everybody, right. thank you, Leonardo. You have to go to the show. So I, I, I want to turn it over to everybody to ask questions. Um, I, but before I do, I want to sort of pull together or sort of some strands that came together as I was listening. Um, and you actually surprised me and answered a lot of questions that I walked in. Um, and, and things that really popped were, um, first of all, this idea that like, of a 
experimental is not actually like experimental is a practice. It's like it's like you're you don't know the answer to your back open the door. I will, and then it comes in like, and you're willing to leave space for whatever happens. Uh, yeah, but I would say the experiment is really the method. We um, copy it. Yeah. copying uh, movies. I mean, that's, that's pretty unique, I think. I, I mean, we don't really talk about um, acting in the way I think most people think right. acting is spoken about. Because um, technicians perform, perform those kind of technical things. And um, our kind of channeling is pretty, I mean, it's what Juliana was talking about. Circuited, but like literally, we are circuited. Like we have like linear receivers, and we're impulsing off of TVs. So I think that's the experiment method that happens at the distance. Um, great. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, yeah, yes. I mean, thank you. Um, like no, because, because, because I, that's the underlying thing that I'm, I'm actually hearing, I guess, is, is actually like, and as everyone's actually saying, it's like the way that most people talk about acting as a thing is not necessarily related to the things that people do as actors in the, in, and the, the Worcester Group has one set of propositions around things that happen on a stage and the technicians and stuff like that. Um, I think it's really interesting. Um, all right, so let's just open it up um, to everybody. Who's got a question? Joe? I, uh, I'm just curious about, uh, like you, uh, two of you worked with Reza and also Richard Foreman a lot. Uh, Kate worked with Foreman as well. Uh, the relationship between you and a director, and how did that affect your acting? I mean, like working with Elizabeth, with the gear and everything, you're going in a specific direction, but then all of y'all went and worked with Richard on a project. Did you bring those devices and work with Richard that way, or? No, I mean, Richard was, we did two collaborations with Richard. It was the Worcester Group, like, co-production, um, Miss Universal Happiness and Symphony of Brass. And in Symphony of Brass, Richard was like, how can I dress that slightly tacky high-tech feel of the Worcester Group? <laughs> so he made like video robots. Um, you know, there were these big robots that had him. His, he recorded himself. And but no, we didn't work. Um, Liz was actually in Miss Universal Happiness, and she didn't work on Symphony of Brass at all. But I would say it's interesting. I think it's what Grotowski talks about. Um, even though our theater couldn't be more different than his theater even though in one of our pieces we imagined we were Krakowski Theater and did a recreation of a section of Acropolis from the film. Um, it's, he talks about that theater is only one thing and, and it's the confrontation. It's, I mean, what's it? not only one thing, but it emanates from one simple equation, which is the confrontation between the actor and the director. The conflict, the confrontation, that doesn't mean you're fighting all the time, but the director is facing you down. He, you can't lie. You, you know what I mean. You, you're there, and so even though um, you know Liz and Richard couldn't be more different, uh, although I guess they're both experimental theater and probably far different than some other directors I don't know. But he's very male. It all to me. I mean, you guys know him better. But it's, it's happening in his fertile imagination and it's his playground and you're a figment in there and he's like seeing you and taking from you but it's not as open a room. In, in Liz's room, like anybody can shoot an arrow. The answer can come from anywhere, although ultimately she gets to say pretty much. But, um, but I think uh, that it, there, you have to, I think the best theater comes from strong directorial position. And then of course when the audience comes in, that's that 
position manifold, but it's, it's about that conversation. I remember being um, completely mystified by Richard Foreman when I first started working for him because uh, he hired a bunch of us uh, former Dara Luz actors en masse to do a play called Hotel Fuck or Paradise Hotel or whatever it was called, whatever city we were in. But, um, uh, so I assume that meant that it wasn't long after uh, Reza had died, too, and I, I assumed that meant that he wanted us to kind of <coughs> do what he'd done for Reza in his play, and it was not at all. He wanted to do what he does to his actors with us, I think because we'd been touring a lot, honestly. Um, but uh, maybe, maybe that's not fair. Yeah, I think he also felt that maybe he would, that he guys, the guys who would not be offended by his text, all these guys did oh, all yeah, this stuff. Yeah, he wouldn't be maybe. offended. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> um, but it was fascinating because, like, we spent it was a twelve week rehearsal process, six days a week. Everybody, you meet everybody in the room, whether you're working that day or not. Incredibly slow. You generate about forty plays within those twelve weeks, and they get cut and chopped. You get to the point where it's just this one highly reduced thing that is very different than like week four when you were actually kind of excited about it and not completely <laughs> confused, <laughs> and you're kind of on this weird tightrope of like in foreman land. Not, it's not a comfortable place to be, like, at, at all. But it was really, really interesting because I remember, like, I was so angry and mystified. Like, he would say things like, like, for Reza, we had, you know, we were always, like, just, like, working to the point of physical exhaustion uh, and envisioning this kind of radical generosity. Like, we were always, like, trying to, like, connect, and, like, whether it was an angry generosity or, like, a loving one. And then suddenly we get into Richard's world and he's saying, oh, well, you should perform this as if you're performing it for the one smart person in the audience. <laughs> and I was so angry about that because I'm like, well, I'm not performing it for me because I'm not the one smart person in the audience. So, and that seems completely elitist to me. But interestingly, I ended up doing more <coughs> shows for him because like somewhere along the line, um, it became clear that this was just like a very different way of being generous. And I learned, one thing I learned from him that was I really value is like, I always rely very heavily on emotion. Like I know if I'm crying, I love to cry. I know I understand something if I'm in tears and that's very comfortable for me. And suddenly that wasn't what we were trying to do and it wasn't what he wanted me to do. And, and suddenly like to learn how not to cry but still be present in this generous kind of like, like you're a star and it's taken a real long time, a little star, not like a star, um, <laughs> a really, really, really long time for that light to reach the earth to that one smart person or whoever you're telling it as, was amazing to try. And it was an amazing thing to try to be in that world even though it wasn't natural to me personally. And I'm very grateful for those four shows. You know, it's weird. When I worked with Richard Foreman, I found myself having dreams about him. Like he was in my dreams a lot. I think it was because, so like weird things like, you know, we had a container of celery. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was supposed to, I was supposed to eat the celery and it felt nauseous. And then I was going to vomit and have spiritual enlightenment. You know? <laughs> but like I woke up just with the feeling, oh, you know, just, it was weird. I dreamt about him a lot. Just briefly, I think a, a difference between Reza and Richard is that Reza was also a very, very sort of strong director, really, really, when he made a decision, he was very adamant about it. But uh, he was also um, really purely collaborative. It was really sort of a, uh, a tribal experience to be with him. So uh, if Reza asked you to contribute something, he'd very, he'd almost always take it or change it. But he basically had created the pieces with us. He basically sent us out to bring shit back in, and he would then take it and incorporate it. And, and, and Richard would ask for suggestions only so then he could hear all of our suggestions and oh, no. dismiss yeah. it yeah. and come up with yeah. better, his better yeah. idea. Yeah. And this yeah. is the whole thing, you know. But this is also you know, underneath the, the, the terrifying exterior of Richard Foreman is a teddy bear. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the real, the, the, the amazing What's part. available on like archivally from the Richard show? Oh, most all of it is. You know, there's a really amazing documentary. Where can we go? There's an amazing documentary. Lincoln Center yeah. has um, the entire Abdo archive on DVD. Tight right wise. 
you can see the resident at the work. Every day. Oh, see that. And uh, um, Adam Soch, who did all the video um, uh, and the video documentation for Reza, is right now cutting uh, a documentary about our work with Darlews, which is going to include extensive performance footage. In so fact, that's going to be coming out hopefully next year or something. He's showing a little preview of it. Can I just make a plug? At the end of this month, I think it's the 29th and 30th of January up at CUNY Siegel Center. Right. There's a two-day festival of um, theater and performance on film and video. And they're showing a first, I think it's like a 20-minute preview right. cut of the Reza Abdo video. But also, anyone interested in acting will be interested in this. Unfortunately, it's a Thursday and Friday all day long. This is something that CUNY has to do with CUNY scheduling. But um, it's all on the Siegel Center website. There's Worcester Group material. There's a lot of material being oh, shown. Oh, first. Oh, sorry. Um, also, um, I, I have a question, sorry, that came up. Um, but particularly talking about, like, because um, Kate talked about not filling up so much space so that there's room for the audience to be in it too. I didn't say don't fill up, you have to fill up the theater. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. But, but I mean, like you have to be room. open and present and listening to the whole room. Right, so that, so the question that, to your own idea. so is that, so the question that I, that, that made me think of, and I'm particularly thinking about what Juliana and Birgit had said earlier, um, does, is that, it seems to me that's a very vulnerable thing to do. Yes. So, and does that change when you work with different directors? Like, do you feel, or is, is it role-based or project-based? Like, 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 do you feel more safe in a Richard Foreman show where it's more abstract than in another show where the audience maybe has more immediate ways in to what's happening? And you can literally be behind glass. Yeah, so behind I, a wall. So yeah, I was just curious, like, 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 how do you preserve that vulnerable thing that helps us enter it? But how, but does it change from situation to situation? Or well, I mean, to me, I mean, the question you asked before about channeling and stuff. Uh, you know, to me, it's always uh, the circuit you're talking about. It's always with the audience. You know, that those moments that are special is because it's not just happening with you; it's happening with the audience. You know, yes, uh, but uh, and I uh, always is a good thing. You know, it's like um, I, I just this is getting going back to the thing you just said. You know, there was this Joe had a, a, a heart condition from a young age, uh, and uh, he had rheumatic fever and, and had many uh, heart attacks, and he always had this kind of strong sense of never could assume that you know he's going to have this next breath. You know that. You can't just assume, well, oh, I'm good. And that went into performance, too. It was like, you could never say, oh, I, 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 got several, I have several other chances to do this. No, this is the one moment you have to do this. And I, I have a very strong consciousness of that going on to the stage, you know? Like, this is the only moment I have to get this right, <laughs> you know? Even though I know maybe there'll be some other times. Um, so that's made for the very kind of anxiety producing thing in a certain way, but it's a kind of a charge. It's like, this is my, my this is the moment to have this mm -hmm. event happen with other people. And uh, it's a kind of good anxiety. You know, it's just like, you're just not taking the moment for granted. You're not taking this event for granted. Because I developed stage fright. I never used to have it. And uh, 
where, um, well actually, I don't have it so much right now, but that, I kind of, that's why I went and directed the show, because I just didn't, I just, I just thought, oh, I can't do this anymore, because I actually fell off the back of the set and when we were in Sao Paulo, because I was just didn't feel in my body, I didn't, we were working on a piece called Bucare, which was written by Tennessee Williams, and I had a very difficult time, because we were working with, um, kind of performing that I'm just not good at, naturally. And Scott Shepard was very, very good at it. He's like a fish in water. And I was having just a hell of a time and, you know, just getting put through the ringer and, you know, everything was seized and changing things. And, you know, I remember like Liz changed like all the inputs before one show and I was like, you know, but it's gonna be a big mess because I knew the tech guys wouldn't get the cues and she was like, I hope so. <laughs> like, at least, you know, I'd rather, see, I'd rather see an accident than somebody not present. And, um, and, and there you went, off the back of well, the Well, no, no, it was oh. in Sao Paulo. And I remember I was judging myself harshly after this first small scene, and the whole next scene was going to be Scott Nari, the writer and the painter, the two, uh, the, the main sort of most beautiful scene in Bucare, which is kind of a problem set. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember thinking like, I was just like beating myself up and I'm like, what are you doing? Don't beat yourself, just go out there, go backstage and just listen to the guys, just listen. And I just walked right off the back of the set, which is a big reminder the, the to upstairs. never go anywhere in the dark that you haven't been in rehearsal. That's a really good thing for you. <laughs> <laughs> but then I seriously thought, well, you know, I used to just, when I was young, I was just, I just felt so fearless. I had so much enthusiasm and just like energy. And, and then I thought, whoa, maybe I shouldn't, have, maybe I don't, you know, maybe this is, I should, I wasn't gonna leave the witch because I was, you know, my life's work. And I, you know, for me, the imperative in my life right now is to, is to keep the theater going, keep the garage going, keep the theater going. And so I, I said, Liz, you know, I, I need to retire. And so I associate, I assisted her when we made a collaboration with the work Shakespeare Company. And that was the, so happy for me because I felt like I was back to my original impulse. Mm -hmm. um, working with the Woodger Group was being like wowed by this company and ready to do anything that needed to do it. And it was a valuable because I could understand what the performers needed having been there also, so it was like a really great time uh, between Liz and I. And then, then I, she went in, and I stepped out for the Richard Group. So that was good. Mm -hmm. Let me let me interject here. I'm, I'm curious because you've used the term uh, being vulnerable, making yourself vulnerable. Yeah. And and I, I guess I was sort of thinking that that meant the, a fear of failure, a fear that the, the performance would would fall or off, or, or that you or that you would fall off the stage. But I'm also hearing the possibility that you're vulnerable to sort of ego destruction, that the voodoo would take over, that the voodoo would take over in such a way, or that you would be healed in such a way that when the, per and, and as you mentioned, when the performance was over, you were a different person. No, I wasn't talking about ego destruction. That's I was just talking that, about that. But, but I'm one, I when, I, when I, when I proposed, when I said the word vulnerable, I meant, uh, I was suggesting a number of things, but I was also thinking very specifically of performances by, uh, 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 Birgit and Juliana, where they are embodying characters that are in, or situations that are in precarious states, um, and um, um, and leaving both as a human being entering into those spaces, but also even in Twelfth Night, you know, like which is a very frivolous play, a lot not frivolous, but it's a very funny play. There are these moments where it's high comedy, and yet we are having these like emotions, like complicated emotions through the thing because there's space for us to enter. We can both find Olivia hilarious and pathetic, and all these things, and it's like a, not pathetic, but you know, like like whatever troubled, and like so. So my, the vulnerability that I was referring to was as much about sort of the fear of failure as it was about these 
thing, places that actors go, yeah. where they're creating space for us to be with them in these difficult places that may be hilarious or tragic or this or that, and sort of like, you know, what is the negotiation that you have to, like, I don't know how to phrase the question really, but it's, a, it's always an amazing thing. It, I mean, it feels, does feel very specific for from show to show. Even, I mean, like tonight, and also show to show, in the tent, sense of like I have to renegotiate with myself what can the what do you think maybe will help this time mm -hmm. and depending on what the director is like like depending on the way the director works I might need to go in another direction in my spare time if it's not something in rehearsal so that I can feel <coughs> safe enough to trust what we've created to then <coughs> say <laughs> and this, you know, and feeling literally like, what is the theater space like? And I, yeah, like, it, yeah, it comes down to that, you know, and it comes down to, yeah, trust, trusting what the work we've done. And if there's some part that just doesn't feel, then investigating that. Mm -hmm. What, what is that? You know, and it does. It feels like it changes all the time. Because, like with Pig Iron, it was very physical and a lot of just making up the world, which is not a safe place for me. But I also love being entrusted to fail. Like, just do it. Just try. Just try. And then there was the text part, and I was like, I need more help with the text because I don't know Shakespeare well enough to feel that I know it well enough to then be able to be like, this is what I bring to the table. So just, I don't know, it feels like a balancing act with every show, mm -hmm. and, and which is the part that I love about not knowing. Mm -hmm. Like, I will continually not know mm -hmm. every time, and it sucks. <laughs> but it also feels like the greatest entryway to be like, well, what do you need? Mm -hmm. What do you need to make this happen? And Is that a conversation that you have with directors, Sorry. like as actors? Like, like you're saying, what do I, like Richard talking to Richard, to the director, but it's also your relationships to the actors on stage as well. And I'm wondering if you can speak about, I mean, in terms of performance, how that also filters into your process and the, and the work. And I know with ensembles, there's often a, a technique that is shared. Um, and so the difference between working in an ensemble or coming into Pig Iron that has an ensemble, you know, core of performers and, and then what it's like, you know, to, to bring yourself and, and the work and the craft that you do into that process. What was the question? The, I mean, the, the question, sure. sorry, the, so, the, so the question is like, you're not just, so you're, you're creating a performance, but you're creating also a performance with the act, your fellow actors on the stage. And so then how does, how does your own personal technique and, and, and the ways that you're working how does that get influenced or built upon by the, the performers that you're working with? I think it's great to be working with a lot of people with different techniques um, and also to get a chance to work with them over a period of time, like a lot of the companies that have core companies um, in New York or almost even some that function like a rock band, you know, develop the work together, play the work together. But, um, but it's also great, you know, sometimes it's great to be a stranger that can be a kind of freedom too. Like you don't have to necessarily be that intimately connected with everybody's technique and that can be a very powerful thing. I think it's secrets in theater are great generally, particularly between <laughs> actor and director. And uh, you know, it's just, I think it's, it's almost like a kind of surfing, like whatever the dynamic is in any work environment, you kind of learn how it works effectively, the parts you might need to kind of <laughs> ignore <laughs> or surf or build your own sort of psychic bridge over. Speaking of the 
pinfall system and the other performance, I think, is the, the number one thing that gets you through a performance. Because sometimes you have to do, um, you know, I think something that's a solo piece, and then you almost have to do that with the audience. You almost have to choose them as the person you're in dialogue with. <clears throat> but, you know, once you create these sort of character ideas, you know, then you're, you're like, you know, you're an atom bouncing around off another atom. We have time for like one more question. Anybody? Anybody? Well, just piggybacking on what Tony just said, you talked about before the difference between sort of working inside a tribal structure and not. Um, and it feels as if with Julie, you uh, sort of reproduced a tribal structure with just a, a tiny number of people. Well, it's different. I mean, it's like. Um, you know, working with Dan Saber and Julie and music. I mean, mean, not so much tribal, just that Julie is, um, I've known Julie for so long, we've been friends for uh, about 17 years, and so uh, we we pull on that. And so um, it's really great when you have either people you've known for a while or you work with on a regular basis, um, you know, or just people who are open in general. I think that the one thing I've encountered in the so-called straight theater film world, which is the most distressing to me, is people who really are kind of op- openly competitive with you and not sharing, and you have to basically be in this sort of situation where they're trying to figure out how to um, like make themselves, you know, have, I, I, you know, I'm a very interesting person. It's taken me to a point long to actually acknowledge that, that there are people who would undermine you. And I think it's not so much a case in our world, because like if people working in the experimental theater, we're not really careerists. I mean, why, why? <laughs> so, you know, out there it's a little bit more doggy dog. Everybody's trying to get those big roles, and so it's a little distressing to me. And so, one of the reasons I keep coming back and back to this community, and it really is a community thing for me, is that it's just like, you know, there's a sense of a, a shared um, set, of, set of values, you know, and uh, uh, that's wonderful. That seems like a good, good yeah, that seems like a A applause. Thank you.